Good morning, everyone. Um, some of you know me. I was here 14 months ago. I'm Ken Dobbin from Ardest Parish. A very warm welcome to all of you, and uh, especially, thank you, especially to any who are visiting. Thank you for inviting me back to Dromore. To share the gospel with you. I would like also to thank Andrew for preparing the order of service and the slides, and I encourage you to pray for him and Joanne as they prepare for their next steps following the Lord in their new calling. I'm sure they will be sorely missed here and in the diocese, but what a joy it will be and a challenge for all of us to remember them as co-workers, to support them through prayer for their health, for wisdom, and for resolve as they face the many challenges ahead. Uh, the the uh, thought for this morning is displayed on the, the board, on the... Um, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I've, I've titled the sermon this morning, Keeping Company with God. And uh, this verse really enlarges upon that. And it's a good memory verse for us all to learn. Psalm 16, verse 8. This week we have the Holiday Bible Club starting at Tokardu Methodist Church, so all the children will be welcome. And next week the service as usual, and I hope to be here. And after the service this morning, and indeed next week also, we have tea and coffee. Do please stay behind and have a little chat and uh, share fellowship together. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, direct our thoughts. Help us to pray and lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Spirit of God fills the whole world. Amen. Let us worship. Let us join together in the hymn number 578, I Need Thee Every Hour. Let's stand.
besiedelt. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. By what we have done and by what we have failed to do, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. The Collect for the Fourth Sunday after Trinity. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not the things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our Lord. Amen. And we read uh, together Psalm 16, alternative verses. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful heritage. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Amen. Our reading of the Gospel. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely, I would like you to pay your good attention to that word, we'll be thinking about it, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, 
But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing hymn number 566, Fight the Good Fight. Father, we ask you to anoint our ears that we may hear your word through your spirit and that you will speak your word through my mouth. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, As I was saying earlier, the title this morning is Keeping Company with God. And uh, the thought is the, the challenges of life that we face and how we are at risk when we don't keep company with God. God is on the move. We need to stay close or we will lose contact with him. Jesus was walking to Jerusalem and the disciples were walking with him. As I said when we were doing the reading, that word resolutely... Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And I'm sure Andrew at this time is having to be very resolute in preparing for the work that lies ahead for him. It's not an easy path that he has chosen with his wife, and they need to be very much in our prayers. It takes a lot of resolve to set out and follow the Lord the way he is doing. Jesus had counted the cost. He knew what was ahead of him in Jerusalem. It was going to be very tough, and so he braced himself. We say he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He advises us to do the same as we join him in our service with him. What happened? No sooner had he started 
than he immediately ran into rejection. You think I'm following the Lord, everything, the, the path should be smooth, but that is not the case. The people in the Samaritan village did not welcome him. Despite all the good that he had been doing, the people that he had been healing, the miracles that he had performed, they were rejecting him. And that's still the case today. Perhaps some of you have already experienced that as you set out to follow the Lord and do what he's asking you to do. Other people are not interested. Some even oppose you or reject you. I will later illustrate that from something that we are going through at the moment. But let's look first at the rest of the story in Luke 9. His senior disciples wanted to zap them, call down the fire from heaven on the village. The disciples had recently seen Elijah and Moses at the Transfiguration, and perhaps they remembered how Elijah had called down the fire from heaven. Jesus rebuked them. When we are opposed or made unwelcome, our first reaction is often not the right one. And we need to exercise, exercise self-control and patience. And this requires us to keep company with God. Or it say, as it says in Galatians 5, keep in step with the Spirit. The thought again of being on a journey. That can mean standing firm and waiting for God to act not rolling over at the first sign of opposition, but being sure that you are, what you're doing is right and standing firm and doing the things that you can and leaving the rest to God. Galatians 5 also reminds us of our freedom in Christ and is worth reading when you go home. It is one of the set readings for today. We are set free not to indulge ourselves, but to serve others. We are living in a very perilous world. I don't need to be telling you that. You see it every day on your television. We have prayed with David in Psalm 16, keep me safe, O oh my God. Another translation is, deliver us from evil. Evil comes from Satan. There is no evil in God. Man in his natural state is full of evil, and we see that all around us. Are you not shocked and horrified at man's brutality? David in the psalm reminds us in you I take refuge. You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. How true that is. You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. What an example for us from David. He kept company with God. He says, even at night, my heart instructs me. Does that ring a bell with you? Do you sometimes lie awake at night and ponder on God and his goodness to you? In Psalm 63, David is more explicit. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. For, you, for those of you, if you're like me and you find it difficult to sleep sometimes at night, that can be a great comfort to think of God during the watches of the night, to think of Jesus at your right side. David 
who was hounded by Saul and his troops for more than a, a decade, for over 10 years, was able to say of God in verse 5, Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Can you imagine running and hiding through the desert, in the mountains, living in caves, and he's able to say, you have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Do you get that? No matter how tough things are for you, no matter what you're going through, God can give you that peace in your heart like he gave to David. And that's why it's important to keep him at your right side. We started with Jesus resolutely setting out for Jerusalem, and we will rejoin him on that journey. But before we do, what of those who do not keep company with God? What does David have to say about that? In verse 4, he says, the sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. Have you experienced that? I know as I look around in my larger family, and indeed in, at people in the world, it is sometimes difficult to watch those we care for who are not keeping company with God. One bad decision follows another bad decision, and things just get worse for them. It is so important for us to keep company with God, to know Jesus standing at our right-hand side. Jesus was heading for Jerusalem resolutely. When you set out to do something, you have to be resolute because you can very easily be knocked off course. And someone says to him, I will follow you wherever you go. A man along the road. And Jesus very quickly brings a dose of realism. In essence, he says, count the cost. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then Jesus asked two men to follow him. The first says, Lord, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And the second one says, I will follow you, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Now, there's nothing wrong with these two things that have been said. But Jesus must have detected that they were excuses, that they were being less than wholehearted in their commitment to him. For in another reading for today, which you can look up, 1 Kings 19, it tells the story of Elijah calling Elisha. And Elisha made a similar request. If you remember when Elijah threw his cloak over him as a sign of his call, let me kiss my mother and father goodbye, and then I will come. And Elijah didn't object to that because he knew that Elisha was committed and Elisha showed his commitment. He had been plowing in a field with a team of oxen, and there were 11 other teams of oxen. So they must have been a middle-class family, middle-class farmers with lots of plows. And uh, his parents didn't object when he slaughtered the two cattle, the two um, whatever, bulls or whatever it is that you have in a plow. He slaughtered them, and they basically had a barbecue. They had a bit of a party for all the workers in the family. And Elisha set off to follow Elisha and the call of God with a joyful and young man's enthusiastic commitment. The reason we keep company with God every day is so that when the unexpected hits us, we will not be shaken. The words of David 
God is at my right hand. What does he mean by that? If you can envisage the battle line where Paul, or David, as you know, was a great soldier, and most people being uh, right-handed, not like me, left-handed, you would hold the shield in your left hand and the sword in your right hand. So your, your sword arm was very exposed, and you depended on the person beside you with their shield to guard your right arm and your heart. God is at my right hand. Is he at your right hand? He can protect you. I don't know if anybody read the UCB notes this morning. Um, it's the passage from Isaiah, is it? With the Isaiah 59. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. I just thought, here I am coming to preach on this subject, and this is the reading this morning. It was very encouraging. And it's been encouraging too, because we have ourselves come under a lot of attack recently. Everything seemed to be going very well with us in the charity that we run out in Kenya. This year, we had our class eight, which was the year that they progressed from primary to secondary. We had very good results, and uh, four girls out of the nine were going to good quality grammar schools, or secondary schools in Kenya, but at the top end. And two boys, the same, so that was six. Two other girls who did moderately well. We thought it was better that they would go to Polytech, and we sent them there. And one girl who was a little bit immature, we have let resit next year, or this year. And this was absolutely startling for us because this was a really good result. And it cost us like a million shillings almost to send these, which is about 7,000 pounds, to send these kids off the boarding just for the first term. Now, the first term, you have a lot of extra expenses, but it's going to be an expensive four years for us to send them through secondary school. But we were happy because seven years ago, we started our own school in the home, and we rearranged our three homes so that all the primary children were at one home, so we were able to recruit some teachers, but their classes were very small, between 5 and 15 usually. Um, so the, our kids were orphans. Some of them had been traumatically uh, experienced trauma in their lives, and their behavior was not good, and it was important for us to get them in small groups to, to teach them. So this had been going on, and then four years ago, the government rejected our application for a school. So we went to the local primary school and they talked to the headmaster. We registered all our kids through them and we, he agreed that we could still continue to tutor our kids in our own home. And the storm came about three weeks ago when an education officer um, arrived in quite a brutal and uh, arrogant fashion and ordered us to send the children to the primary school. Now, I should add that the average number in the class in the primary school was 78. Some classes had over 90 in them. And this caused us alarm. We had spent a lot of years improving the behavior of our kids and getting good results in education by tutoring them. And my WhatsApp was red hot for a week, just back and forwards. This education officer produced the police, went to the police and asked them to arrest our staff and uh, our manager. They refused because they said we were very helpful to them and kept, children, kept girls whenever they were under threat. And, 
but you've, I just can't get across to you the, the, the experience of fear that there was in the, in the management and the teachers out in Kenya, and the agony it was for me and a few, of, a, a few of us just to make the decisions to try and comply with what the government wanted us to do, but at the same time protect the, the children as well as we are able. We had a lot of people praying. We have a, a prayer line, and a lot of people were praying about this. One of our little girls who had, who had gone to secondary school had come from a fairly bad background. She had, her mother was an alcoholic, and the girl herself had been scalded and had burn marks, bad skin marks all over her face, and one of her hands had been very badly damaged, which we had got treated in a hospital and physiotherapy to try and improve it for her. But she did well in her exam, and she was one of those at secondary school. But if we hadn't been teaching them in small groups, she would have been lost, and many others would have been lost in these big classrooms. So in a way, it was undermining our whole work that we were involved in. When I was challenging whether we should send her to secondary school because of the cost, because she had been in the habit of running away quite regularly whenever anything disturbed her, and a couple of times she got 100 kilometers away in the direction of, her, of, of where she came from in the north of Kenya. The manager put her on the phone. I'm changed now, Dad. I'm a different person. I will work hard, she said to me on the phone. And we sent her. But th th that's the sort of example of the impact that this was going to have on, on these children. We went to all the, the other government officials, the chief, the district commissioner, and we have appointments this coming week with the MP and the um, governor of the county to bring our case. I wrote, set up late one night and wrote a letter to the education officer. At first she refused to even take it from our manager, and then when she took it she refused to read it. So that's the sort of arrogance that we're dealing with. No, no care for the children. Certainly not what is in the best interest of the children. And it was among the sort of this flood of pressure that we were able to stand with God at our right hand and know that He has the best interests of the children at heart and that he will act in due course for the better, betterment of them. Last weekend, we were able to negotiate with the education officer and the headmaster that rather than amalgamating our children into the classrooms, we would move our school down to, our little tutoring school down to the primary school, and he would give us some classrooms that were spare because they're building an extension on the school at the moment because of changes in the education system. So that has given us a, a temporary relief that our, our, our kids are still being tutored in small classes. But I, I understand this lady is still after us, if you like, and trying to enforce the integration of our kids into the classes. We've also heard that the, the uh, district commissioner has a letter transferring this lady out of the district. So we don't know what's happening, really. And this week, we have appointments with the governor and the, the MP to see if they can help us to come to some sort of a compromise which will protect the children but keep us within the law. So it's having that, in, in, our, in your own circumstances, it's having that ability not to roll over and die when something happens and just give in, and at the same time, keeping yourself within what's right and what's the law, but standing up for what you know God has asked you to do. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises a banner on our behalf. So the message today, don't be surprised when you set out to follow 
Jesus that people will oppose you, they will ignore you, because you, they see you as doing good. You're a do-gooder. Keep company with God. He is the one who will stand by you. And the alternative? Your sorrows will increase if you follow other gods. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have warned us that we will face opposition and persecution and confirmed that when we take our stand, you will be at our side to support and strengthen us. Grant to us that same resolve you showed when you set your face to go to Jerusalem in the full knowledge of what lay before you. We pray in your name. Amen. Let us worship together as we sing the hymn number 593, O Jesus, I Have Promised.
us remain standing for the affirmation of faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe and trust in God the Father who made the world. Do you believe and trust in God the Son? I believe and trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed mankind. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit? I believe and trust in the Holy Spirit who gives life to God and God. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, our Son and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Let's just quieten our hearts as we pray together. Father, we pray for the church worldwide that we may all be one. Grant that every member of your church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world that there may be justice and peace on earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that your glory may be proclaimed through our lives. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those known to us in need of your touch, and in the silence we bring them to your throne of grace. And in particular, we remember the Mills family's recent bereavement, and also Andrew and Joanne. Let us pray. Stretch. Stretch out your hand to bring healing to those who are sick, comfort for those who mourn, and hope to those in despair. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We have a gospel to proclaim. Number 491.
Please be seated. Lord Jesus, you emptied yourself, taking the form of a servant. Through your love, make us servants of one another. Lord Jesus Christ, for our sake you became poor. May our lives and gifts enrich the life of your world. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for all the benefits that you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. Most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I see you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. And one more prayer before we say the grace. Father, we dedicate ourselves to serve you faithfully and to follow Christ, to face the future with him, seeking his special purpose for our lives. Send us out now to work and to witness freely, gratefully, and hopefully in the power of the Holy Spirit and for the honor and glory of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just let us say the grace together, and as we do so, let's say it to one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.